Thanks, Eric. My name is Hump. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to talk to you today about um, a group of geochemists that developed a field they called landscape geochemistry. This arose in the former Soviet Union many, many years ago. And the reason I bring it up is because I think it's relevant today. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about kind of what is a geochemical landscape, uh, why humans uh, need to be part of the conversation, and then illustrate it with you know, a short example from my own research group. A guy named John Fortescue, a Canadian geochemist in uh, oh, the <clears throat> 80s and 90s, wrote a series of papers and a book on landscape geochemistry. He uh, kind of summarized it as a holistic scientific discipline aimed at the geochemistry of the environment. I think in today's terms, we might lump regional geochemistry, uh, critical zone studies, environmental chemistry in kind of the same basket as landscape geochemistry. The original ideas came from Boris Polinoff uh, in the 1920s. He was a, a soil scientist in the Soviet Union who decided that uh, geochemistry had to be added to his understanding of the uh, development of soils. And then his two students, Alexander Perelman and Alfred Dovna Glasnovskaya, I hope I haven't butchered that, uh, carried on and wrote books and papers that were influential at the time. Alfred Dovna is now 96 years old and still publishing in Moscow. So, I mean, basically, the term, the, the, the word holistic is, is appropriate here. Uh, a geochemical landscape arises from the interplay of the, the whole range of processes that operate at the Earth's surface. And it involves a number of hierarchies of time, space, chemical complexity, and scientific understanding. Time, from geologic all the way to chemical reaction time. Space, from global to microscopic or submicroscopic. Uh, the understanding of uh, element, species, and isotope behavior and distribution, and eventually leading to uh, simple descriptive statistics, process understanding, and simulation. I think this is, the, the, the thing that's um, a little different here is, is the purview of landscape geochemistry is quite broad. Many of us tend to focus uh, at local microscopic or uh, on, on, on specific processes that operate over uh, a restricted ranges of, of time scales, but landscape geochemistry uh, spans the whole range. The reason that humans need to be part of the discussion is that we're just, there's so many of us. This is a plot of uh, world population growth, starting with uh, the development of agriculture all the way through to the Middle Ages, uh, the population growth was sort of slow and steady, and then with the Industrial Revolution, it's taken off dramatically. This graph <clears throat> from the U.S. Census Bureau uh, shows population from 1950 projected out to 2050. Here's where we are today. The population of planet Earth has doubled in my lifetime. And, and lest you think that that's just because I'm old, you know, if you're born in 1980 or so, it will come close to doubling in your lifetime. That has all kinds of consequences. For one thing, uh, we're not making dirt as fast as we're making people. And, and as Eric said, soil is probably our second most precious resource uh, after water. So, uh, how we treat our land is really important to the future of humanity. To illustrate <clears throat> kind of the scope of human impact on the surface of the earth, I've chosen an example from the United States. It was developed 
by uh, some USGS colleagues, and it's used with their permission. What it shows is a series of polygons that are watersheds, and the colors are erosion yield of water and wind sediment in metric tons per hectare per year. So the darker colors are quite large erosion yields. In the lower left here, you'll see changes in this graph, which is the separated values, the rates of water erosion, uh, wind erosion, accumulation of reservoir sediment, and net terrestrial sediment. In this, in this plot, you'll see these little red dots that are dams. So now I'm going to run this from 1700 on forward, and you'll see as the land was populated from east to west, the impact uh, on erosion of agriculture, basically. In a relatively short time, uh, the footprint of humanity on North America has been profound. Uh, and of course, Europe's been populated for a lot longer, so one might expect comparable or larger sort of uh, erosion yields for Europe. Um, the rates of these processes peaked at about uh, 1930s. This was an era we call the Dust Bowl where poor agricultural practices, uh, coupled with a drought, allowed uh, millions of tons of topsoil to blow away and led to the largest population migration in US history. Bruce Wilkinson uh, has been looking at long-term uh, deep time erosion rates as compared to, to modern ones, such as the ones I just showed, and concluded that humans now move 10 times more Earth's surface materials than the sum of all natural processes. You might expect then that given the extent of this migration of materials or surface materials, there could be impacts uh, on geochemistry, and there probably should be. Uh, I think one of the issues was, was captured kind of nicely here by Mary Lou Zubak and her uh, presidential address to the Geological Society of America, documenting and understanding natural variability is a vexing topic in almost every environmental problem. How do we recognize and understand changes in natural systems if we don't understand the range of baseline levels? Uh, based on considerations of that type, uh, my colleague at the USGS, Dave Smith, and I uh, developed a program to uh, map the geochemistry of soils of the U.S. And now, in collaboration with uh, the Canadian and Mexican surveys, this will be a geochemical map for all of North America. As part of that, we did a series of pilot studies. One was north-south, and this one, which was east to west across the 38th parallel. The vertical bars here are, the, are proportional to the relative abundance of chromium. You can see at the west end of the transect, uh, in California, uh, an obvious anomaly. So our thinking was, what happens when you see an anomaly like this at a sort of a national scale? When you drill down into that, what is it really going to look like? Uh, so I'm going to focus in this talk to considerable extent on chromium. Uh, for one thing, it's a good tracer of, of rock sources, geochemical sources of soil. And another is there's a, a human um, health dimension to chromium. The dominant redox state of chromium is chromium-3, uh, which is highly insoluble and refractory, but required in small amounts as a micronutrient involved in uh, lipid and fat metabolism. Chromium-6, on the other hand, chromate, uh, is extremely toxic. It's a, it's a powerful carcinogen when inhaled, and uh, if you believe the movie Aaron Brockovich, if you drink chromium-rich water as well. So our study then is, is focused in California at the, at the 
western part of the U.S. This is the Great Valley of California, Central Valley of California. It is important because it's one of the great agricultural regions of the nation. The yellow here are crop and pasture lands. The red are cities. Our talk, or certainly our study, is further focused on the northern end of the Sacramento Valley, uh, of the Great Valley, which is called the Sacramento Valley, uh, and is, that is shown here. So this is the northern one-third of the Great Valley, the Sacramento Valley, bounded on, by the, on the east by the Sierra Nevada Mountains, in part on the north by the Klamath Mountains, and on the west by the Coast Ranges. The Sacramento River runs down uh, near the center of the valley, and the city of Sacramento, the capital of California, is here. The river and the city are, are good geographic benchmarks for some future slides. I'm going to mention a couple of different geologic units. The, the geology of this area is extremely complex, but I am going to have occasion to talk about these rocks in pink, which are granitic rocks of the Sierra Nevada batholith. And although it's kind of hard to see at this scale, ultramafic rocks, which occur in the foothills of the Sierras uh, at the north end of the valley in the Klamath, and then in the coast ranges to the west of the valley. The importance is that there's a dramatic compositional difference between granitic rocks and ultramafic rocks. These are rich in silica aluminum and then things like calcium rare earths, et cetera. The ultramafic rocks, which are largely now converted to serpentinite, are rich in chromium, nickel, vanadium, magnesium, iron. And then the last unit is this, shown in yellow, is a very thick sequence of uh, marine rocks formed as part of a four-arc basin in the Jurassic. We're going to focus down once again on this rectangle area, which is in the southern part of the Sacramento Valley. So we're changing scales here. Uh, and this, this plot shows the location as red and sort of purple dots of uh, 1,300 soil samples and about 500 stream sediment samples. Soil samples in red, stream sediments in pink. The actual symbols are it's a, a proportional symbol plot, where the size of the symbol is proportional to the abundance of chromium in each sample. So the smallest dot is from 12 to 48 um, milligrams per kilogram chromium. For comparison, the geometric mean for the U.S. is a number like 40. On the other hand, the larger, largest dots range from 100 to thousands, so uh, clearly anomalous on a continental scale. I'd like to draw your attention to a couple different features, although there's a lot of structure to this data. The ultramafic rocks, the serpentinites in the foothills of the Sierras, uh, as expected because they're rich in chromium, the soils have high chromium associated. Also, the, the western side of the Sacramento Valley, along and western of the, uh, west of the Sacramento River, here's, here's the city of Sacramento, are, are tend to be enriched in chromium as well. Uh, based on some statistical analysis, uh, the western valley here is also enriched in vanadium, cobalt, nickel, and magnesium, as well as lithium, which is not an ultramafic element. Calcium, on the other hand, shows kind of an opposite behavior. Here's the Sacramento River. Here's the city of Sacramento. Calcium is enriched on the east side of the valley, as is calcium in stream sediments in the higher Sierras. There's a similarity here between high Sierra material and uh, eastern Sacramento Valley material. The eastern valley is also enriched in rare earth elements, strontium, uranium, thorium, titanium, uh, a suite that's characteristic of uh, more silicic or granitic rocks. Why this separation across the valley? Well, <clears throat> it's related to uh, geomorphology. Over millennia, the Sacramento River, during its flood stages, built up a levee uh, high enough to separate sediment transport from crossing, crossing the valley. More recently, of course, due to flood control issues, the, the uh, levee has been artificially increased, but it's existed for, for a long time and, and uh, maintained this separation. The east side of the valley has received material from the high Sierras uh, by a couple different mechanisms. One is glaciation, 
During the Pleistocene, the Sierras, High Sierras, were repeatedly glaciated, and then during deglaciation, material was washed down into the valley. But the real issue here is anthropogenic. Uh, here's the Sacramento River in the city of Sacramento. This was the site of a major gold rush starting in about 1849 or so. Part of the gold was obtained from what's called placer mining or hydraulic mining. The miners would shoot high speed jets of water uh, against alluvial material that had some gold in it. The material would wash down, they'd separate the gold uh, by density and uh, the rest of the material was just waste. Well, this waste, uh, it, was, it was billions of tons. It inundated the Sacramento Valley, destroyed farms, um, basically stopped navigation on the Sacramento River, uh, and so it was, a, it was a huge issue, and ultimately it was only stopped by, by a, a, a lawsuit. So anthropogenic processes have had an enormous impact on the eastern side of the valley. So let's talk about the western side of the valley and how it's achieved its composition. So this is a map of lithium. Uh, again, it's one of these proportional symbol plots. Uh, the smallest symbol is 3 to 15 milligrams per kilogram of lithium. The largest one is 54 to 77. Clearly, there's a segregation of high values on the east side of the valley. And that's interesting because unlike the elements we saw previously, chromium and such, uh, ultramafic rocks are depleted in lithium. On the other hand, marine shales are enriched. And I, I mentioned the Great Valley sequence of marine rocks fronting the west side of the valley. Uh, we've analyzed these rocks extensively and they contain abundant, extremely abundant lithium. So we can use the, the difference, the dichotomy between uh, lithium coming from a marine source and chromium coming from a uh, ultramafic or serpentinite uh, to understand the, the sources of materials in the Sacramento Valley. So this is a triangular plot in which titanium, which we use as sort of an immobile element, uh, goes from zero to one on a, on a uh, normalized scale lithium from zero to one on this axis, and chromium on zero to, zero to one on this axis. Ultramafic rocks and uh, the overlying soils uh, plot at the chromium end of the diagram with very low titanium and very low lithium. The Great Valley sequence uh, rocks and their overlying soils fall towards high lithium, uh, high titanium and low chromium. The valley samples, and these are all soils from the western Sacramento Valley, fall on something of a mixing line between the two. The important point is that a component of chromium is derived from ultramafic rock and then transported down into the valley. So what we're going to do now is consider the consequences of transporting chromium from an ultramafic rock up in the coast ranges down to the Sacramento Valley. So if you make a uh, magnetic separate of, uh, from soil that's overlying the ultramafic rocks up in the coast ranges on the west, uh, you'll get a lot of material. Um, but if you look at it in the scanning electron microscope, you see no chromium at all, or virtually none. The reason is, if you make a uh, polished grain mount, and, and look at the uh, cross-section of the grains, what you see is chromium in the form of the mineral chromite, an iron chromium oxide, which is the dominant resonance for chromium in these rocks, is mantled by magnetite. And uh, that's why you can't see it unless you cut through the grain. By the time you get down to the valley, however, the magnetite uh, rim is gone and chromite is exposed thus uh, potentially exposing chromium to pore fluids after downstream transport and abrasion. We can use another characteristic of chromite, its refractory nature, to get a little more insight into the behavior of chromium during transport from the source area to the valley. Uh, chromite is, like I said, refractory, 
the normal dissolution procedure we use for uh, rocks involving four acids, nitric, hydrochloric, perch uh, perchloric, and hydrofluoric, only weakly dissolves chromite, especially coarse chromite. On the other hand, if you fuse the sample, sample with lithium metaborate, you get a total number. This is a, a shot of, of a chromite grain after the four acid treatment. It's slightly etched, but not much. So we can use that as kind of a crude reactivity guide. Um, so what this is is a box and whisker plot where the lower end of the box is 25th percentile, the top is 75th, the median 5th and 95th percentile of the data. The data is arrayed from west to east across uh, the study area. So ultramafic rock serp serpentines uh, in the coast ranges uh, are only uh, slightly soluble in, in the four acids. Here zero would be insoluble and one would be fully soluble. So only about 20% on average of the uh, chromium dissolves in the four acids. The soil's a little bit more. But as you work your way into the valley, you see a, a much higher proportion of chromium soluble in the four acids, implying something has changed along the transport path. So we've been working on a couple of different hypotheses. One is during uh, transport from the source area to the valley floor, uh, the grain size of the chromite decreases and the solubility of the chromite is proportional to uh, the grain size, increasing with decreasing grain size. And the other is that, the, that during transport the mineralogy, mineralogy has changed from chromite to some other phase. So this is a plot of, uh, these are valley soils only. Uh, it's a plot of that ratio of four acid to total chromium. So again, insoluble uh, in the four acids, fully soluble in the four acids. The different colors represent uh, a number of different data sets from the Sacramento Valley, including the ones I've talked about earlier, but a number of others. What you see here is uh, roughly a parabolic curve. Uh, a parabolic curve is indicative of a grain that's dissolving as a function of surface to volume ratio. As the grain gets smaller, the surface to volume ratio increases and the grain's more soluble in the four acids. So this fit is basically a parabolic fit with an exponent that comes out of assuming a surface to volume dependency. We also had to assume a constant background of 100 ppm of some material that's not chromite. And that such a material is actually present in the samples. These are transmission electron micrographs. Uh, this is a smectite. Uh, its uh, dimension is 350 microns, and it contains substantial chromium. We also found quite a number of iron nanoparticles are in oxide nanoparticles with high uh, abundances of chromium. This uh, is the clay fraction, or the finest fraction, and uh, we think, just based on relative abundance of the clay fraction, it accounts for that 100 ppm. So there is some material that is uh, non-chromite, but the bottom line is most is chromite. Either because we've removed these magnetite rims during transport, or, um, because of decreasing grain size of the chromite as it moves towards the valley, what happens is there's a lot of dissolved chromium in the groundwater. Chromium uh, is most soluble in its six-valent form as chromite, so this is potentially toxic uh, chromium. The largest dot here is uh, 30 to 50 uh, ppb of, chrom of chromium in solution. Uh, the World Health Organization maximum contaminant level is 50, as is the California MCL. The area around Davis, California, here with this rectangle, is particularly high in chromium in the groundwater. Uh, this is the USGS data from our NWIS, or National Water Information System database, but data uh, obtained locally uh, by the University of California, Davis, shows values, many values over 100 and some up to 600. Uh, milligram or PPB in this area. I, just for reference, uh, Puda Creek is here, and the town of Davis lies north of it. 
we have taken a number of auger holes whose depth is of several meters, in this case four meters. Um, the uh, deeper drill holes, which I'm not showing data for here, are located here. Poudre Creek, uh, which I mentioned, is there. The town of Davis is here, and UC Davis is, is sort of there. What you see in this, in this uh, chemical data from the auger hole is in green, total chromium. Uh, total chromium relates to the upper graph and is, is extremely high, up to 600 uh, milligrams per kilogram, remembering that the continental average for the U.S. is a number like 40. On the other hand, chromium-6, to total chromium-6 is very low micrograms per kilogram. On the right is a plot of total manganese in orange and easily reducible or reactive manganese in, in this darker color. The reason manganese is important is that uh, the primary oxidant from insoluble chromium-3 to toxic chromium-6 is manganese oxide, which uh, couples uh, to the, to the chromium-3 and uh, produces manganese-2 and, and chromium-6. Uh, microbes are involved in uh, reoxidizing the manganese. They do that by many orders of magnitude higher rate than uh, would occur naturally. Let me just go back here. Uh, a point I failed to make here is that Chris Mills, who's done a couple of years of experiments, and it's hard to it's hard to show a couple of years of data with one slide, but uh, basically what he's shown is that manganese is not limiting to this oxidation reaction. There's a lot of extra manganese. So some other factor is controlling the oxidation of chromium-3 to chromium-6. That factor appears to be uh, pH. So this is added protons as HCl per kilogram of soil, incubated for a constant two weeks, showing increase in chromium-6 over that time period. So hydrogen ions are important. So the hypothesis we're working on is that a big source of the protons necessary to drive rates of, of, uh, of chromium-3 oxidation higher is uh, nitrification, which ammonia reacts with oxygen to produce nitrite and protons, and nitrites further then subsequently oxidize to nitrate. It's these protons that may drive the uh, increased abundance of chromium-6 in groundwater. Uh, this is one of many, many experiments, but what it shows is liquid ammonium polyphosphate. This is a fertilizer. We, we used a commercial fertilizer in roughly the same proportion as a farmer might apply on their land. And what you see is chromium-6 increases, ammonium sulfate decreases compared to a control. So, so if if oxidation of ammonia to form nit nitrate is uh, the source of the protons that drives chromium-6 formation, then a proxy for that process would be how, how much nitrate is there left in the groundwater as a result of this process. So <clears throat> this is a map, again, from the USGS National Water Information System. Uh, the various colored dots are increasing abundances of nitrate as nitrogen. The city of Sacramento is here, Sacramento River is there, Davis, California, Poudre Creek are down here. This bar separates uh, the uh, above and below the median nitrate for the U.S. U.S. Geological Survey did a uh, national survey across land use gradients for how much nitrate's in the water and the uh, median value was about 3.3, which of course included a number of agricultural lands. So what you can see is in the uh, warmer colors, fairly high concentrations of nitrate in the western Sacramento Valley. So uh, we're pursuing this still, but it, it at least tentatively seems possible that this nitrate in groundwater uh, may indicate a source of protons, which in turn can drive uh, chromite or chromium-3 oxidation. So once again, this is an example of a large-scale anthropogenic process which uh, has 
perhaps some unintended consequences. I mentioned at the beginning that inhalation of chromium uh, through a, of chromium-6 through a, through a pathway of uh, breathing in dust uh, is a known carcinogen. Uh, this is data that we got from the California Air Resources Board. What it shows is chromium to aluminum ratio versus month of the year. Uh, the original air data, dust data, was on a per volume basis per cubic meter of air sampled. And so to compare it to the soil data, we've normalized both to aluminum. So this band here of yellow is the chromium to aluminum ratio of the western Sacramento Valley soils. Uh, and in, at certain times of the year, particularly winter, chromium spikes to high values. We're collaborating with a group at SUNY Stony Brook uh, who looks at uh, influence of earth materials on, on human health. And uh, this is a startup of a thesis by Siobhan Hilton. Uh, she exposes our soils to human live human lung tissue and looks at the damage and finds increasing cell damage with increasing exposure to soil. Like I said, this is early days, but it does indicate that some component of the soil is, is, is active in human lung cells and may be somehow tied to the carcinogenic properties. So I started off this way, talking about the, scale, the range of processes that are involved in evolution of a geochemical landscape. The ones in red are the ones I talked about. And I talked about these series of hierarchies. Uh, the ones in red are the ones that I covered in one way or another. Uh, I think that in terms of space, uh, each of these continental, local, microscopic, and even submicroscopic contributed to the story. So what is the real bottom line here? Uh, the impact of humanity on the surface of our Earth is large and growing. Uh, civilizations have fallen, uh, many due to their lack of attention to how they're treating their land. The, uh, one of the cradles of civilization in the uh, Fertile Crescent along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Uh, the Sumerians to which we owe writing and structured societies and uh, were extremely innovative, but they ended up ch choking themselves off by salinizing the soils and uh, the soils were silted up and now that area is a bleak desert. Uh, an important point that I'd like to make is that we are forcing the Earth's environmental systems to change at a rate that is more advanced than our knowledge of the consequences. Um, part of the problem is that the issues we're dealing with are highly uh, integrative across disciplines. Um, John Muir, the founder of the Sierra Club, once said, when you touch anything at all, you'll find that it's hitched to everything else in the universe. I think geochemists, because they're operating interdisciplinary, in interdisciplinary fashion uh, as part of their uh, normal uh, work, uh, have a lot to contribute to understanding the changes that are going on in our planet uh, and, and, and helping us to understand how these can be projected into the future. And I think Boris Polinoff, uh, whose holistic view of the evolution of landscapes uh, was, was, I think, prescient, would probably do just fine if he was alive and working today. So like all studies, uh, there was a lot of people involved. Um, there was originally supposed to be five talks on this subject at this meeting, but the U.S. government, in its infinite wisdom, gr <laughs> didn't grant permission for most of them to come. Uh, but I'd like to recognize them anyway. And we've worked with a whole long range of people. And we have a number of publications available for download on the Applied Geochemistry website. Thank you.